Welcome to a, a new episode of the Bandwagon Podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by a comic actor, writer, and generally an all-round nice person, um, Sukhojla. Oh, thank you. That's the nicest intro. You can do the intro for my tour. Oh no, no, yeah, actually, yeah, we could we could talk about. It. We'll get to the tour anyway, but um, okay. I think when we've had our technical problems within here, I thought it was just probably the most uh, holistic way of uh, entering uh, uh, the conversation. But I do uh-huh. put it down to when we had the conversation initially about, you know, you were talking about the, the eclipse and sort of things. I think it's brought quite a, ba- a bit of bad energy for me at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah loads of people are struggling at the moment. And I know that people are, some people are like, oh, it, you know, no, it's nothing. That's all, that's all bullshit. That's all spiritual stuff. And I'm like, I'm talking to everyone, even my friends who don't believe in like this kind of thing or astrology or the planets or whatever. And even they're like, why am I finding this week such a struggle? Why is my laptop breaking down? Why is my phone really glitchy? Why is everything taking three times longer for me to do? Why do I feel like, like I said to you when we were off air, I was like, I feel like I've not had a coherent thought all week. And now I'm like, what's good, you guys? Don't make any plans. Just what go about, does, does, Do you reckon that uh, that bad luck passes on, if you, especially you didn't see it because it was cloudy down here in Birmingham. So I couldn't yeah. see it also. Uh, to be honest, I'll be honest, I forgot. I was driving. I missed it. I, was, I had to go to Tesco. I had to go. Oh, the eclipse! Break. You're talking yeah, yeah. about the eclipse. Yeah. Um, I don't think many people saw it because of cloud cover that oh, day. That's fine. I don't think it's bad luck either. I don't. I don't really believe in good luck and bad luck. Really, to be honest, I feel like it just is what it is. It is what you make of it as well. Uh, so optimistic. So, <laughs> so talking about yeah, yeah. So talking about what you make of it. That's, your career you're definitely something that I've seen I say something as a product but um I've definitely seen yourself coming more and more on sort of social media you're on, on the timelines a lot more and you know you can see this this trajectory coming going up in the right direction yeah. um you know how, how do you feel that like your opportunities have, have changed is it is it do you feel the same way or do you think that oh I was still the same or suck um I don't think I've changed as a person um I think as a person, I'm just the same. Um, I'm prob- I'm, I'm, I thought maybe I'd be a bit more confident at this stage because of the opportunities that I've got. Um, that's yet to kick in. I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted on that if that ever kicks in. Yeah. Um, I, think it, I, I think I'm still figuring it out as well. I think um, it's weird what people, because a lot of people when I did Mock the Week were like, that's it, you've made it. Like you've made it, you've gone and mocked a week. And I'm like, it doesn't, in the industry, that's not really, like it's a great thing to do, of course, and it's very prestigious and, you know, got a cult following, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, you know, a brilliant opportunity. But I don't, to me, that's like, no, there's so many other things that I need to do. And I don't, I don't, I think sometimes we can kind of get caught up in what success is and like what success has to look a certain way. I'm really um, fortunate because of, I think timing has a big part to play in it. A lot of right place, right time stuff. A lot of who you speak to as well and like who you get to know and who you connect with and networking, although I hate that word and I hate the whole concept of it as... What, networking? Uh, yeah, I just say, I think the way the way that like the connotations of the word networking, when it's like, oh, you're just hanging around, like, you know, being a bit, you know, a bit like sharks about it, you know, with glasses of you know, plastic glasses of warm white wine in your hand and like, you know, going, oh yeah, you know, not really kind of connecting with the person, just looking over their shoulder to see who else is in the room. Like that kind of networking. That's I really just like a wedding though, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what, I don't go to them either. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like if, I wanted, if I wanted someone to criticize are you, are how you, I look. Are you that famous now? Like, oh, I'm just saying, sorry. I don't know how you were with the word famous. I'm just going to just say. So are you that kind of popular now that you can kind of choose what family events that you want to go to or friends? I've always done that, Ricky. I've always done that. I've always been the kind of person who's just gone, nothing to do with fame or popularity or anything. I'm like... I just, I just hate you. No, I'm just like, <laughs> that's cool. I don't know you. Like, I'm not... Like, do you know what I mean? I'm like, if it's close family, of course. But if it's Flannies, 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 wedding at whatever, and my mum's like, we've got to go because they came to our part three years ago and now we've got to go to there and I'm like but yeah that's nice that doesn't really I'll be honest um if I wanted someone to criticize me for what I'm wearing and what I'm doing with my life I just stay at home with my mom <laughs> yeah I oh I get to you get to that point where you just look in the mirror and just like you're just an absolute mess yeah, yeah. It is. it's like cool I, I'm good with that thanks I'm all right I'll just do that and, and that way 
I can do that at home in my leggings under a gumball and not in something that has got no lycra in it. <laughs> you know, sitting in some like crafty <laughs> hall somewhere. Yeah, or get it changed in the, halfway through the actual event itself. Yeah, that's what that's what I should be doing. But no, I don't I don't really buy into that. Obviously, if it's close people, then like, yeah, of course. But, you know, otherwise, if it's like the whole family, like me, because it's just me, mum and dad. If, like, if I'm like, oh, well, we've got an invite somewhere. I'm like, guys, you go. You go. Like, <clears throat> and also, like, as a woman, as a woman who's got a non-traditional job, as a woman who does not fit the kind of, you know, the, the beauty standards that we have for women um, in our community in general. I'm like. Well, you mean you ain't a makeup artist? Huh? <laughs> you, you don't do makeup artists at the same. I'm not an MUA. Um, <laughs> I'm not an MUA or a personal trainer. Yeah, but I, I, I got put right. I used to call it M. I used to call it Moi, and I got. I used oh. to call it Moas. Yeah, I got uh, Ravita. Uh, she um, she corrected me, and I, I've, I've I've been very strict on the way. I said no, no. It's actually uh, you know, it's not. It's makeup artist. <laughs> makeup artist, not not a MUA. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't go to that. I don't go to that kind of thing. But also like. Um, what were we talking about? I've just gone off on a tangent about no, no, it's fine. weddings and stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I kind of pull it back into kind of a more formal structure for me. Um, <laughs> you, you, you talked about being kind of like the non-traditional kind of avenue that you went through. I, I mean, arts in general is something that is where people don't... Um, might not necessarily associate South Asian population doing that kind yeah. of stuff. It, it yeah. is growing in there. But at the time when you went in, especially around comedy, what was your route to comedy? Um, so comedy was never the plan. Literally yeah. all of all of my life has not been planned. Like there's been no, you know, like they, you know, like those kids that you go to school with at 18, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go to uni, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be a, an engineer, I'm gonna be a doctor. I used to mm. look at them and be like, how do you know? Like, how do you know? I never, I didn't have a kind of strong inkling to do it, but I just knew that I was good at English and drama. So I went to drama school to study to be an actor, did that for a few years, then I kind of like was like, the acting industry itself has its own issues you know just it being incredibly unstable like there's no job security there's no then you've got your castings and I was like why am I going up for like not even going up for corner shop owner I'm going up for corner shop owner's wife I was like what what, what? I'm not even and I was and I was like terrorist wife doctor's wife like all these kind of auditions that I was going up for and I was like what am I doing like you know all my mates had like graduated uni at this point they were kind of starting their careers like they were in their like first grown-up jobs and I was like, I don't want to do, I want to do something where I'm making a bit of a difference as well. So, so I you, started. So you're acting their jobs. Yeah, exactly. Well, not even, not, well, I hope none of them were terrorist wives, but like, you know. <laughs> we don't know. You know. But I was definitely like playing at being a grown up because I didn't, certainly didn't feel it. I still don't, to be honest. Um, and then I kind of went to, I, I started working with children with learning disabilities. And um, so I used, you started working in schools and stuff in primary schools as a learning support assistant. I really enjoyed that. And then I was like, okay, I guess I'll be a teacher, right? Because that's the kind of, you know, that's the next, you know, there's, there's not much career progression, I guess, you know, if you're an LSA or you're a TA, it's like you're kind of there and it's great. And I love that job. But I was like, I kind of want a bit more now and want to do something else. But then I turned 30 and I, I turned 30 and I had a bit of a, um, I guess any age that you turn that has a zero at an end, you, you kind of, you, you you get a bit reflective, right? You kind of go, what am I doing? And um, so I turned 30 and I was like, man, I am so unhappy. I just remember coming, walking home with my friend and, we, you know, we'd, we'd been out, we'd been celebrating and I just like, it, I just went really quiet and I just went, I'm so unhappy. And it just kind of came out of like nowhere. And it, it was just that real light bulb moment for me. And I said, look, I, you know, I'm going to give acting another go. I'm going to give it. And, and she was like, don't do it. And all my other friends were like, I think there was only one or two that were like, yeah, fuck it, go for it. Go, like, go for it. Go for it. And everyone else was like, really? Is this what you want to do? You know, 30, you know, we're all getting married. We're all you know, having babies. We're all buying houses. We, we've all got nice dolly here from John Lewis. Like, you know, they're all like, they're all going up in the world. Yeah. And, and I had, um, you know, and I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to give it a year. And also a year is no time, right? A year is nothing. But also a year is nothing in, term, in, in the arts because you can easily go at something, do your hardest, work really hard at things, even go to these bloody networking things and you can still get nowhere. But that doesn't mean anything because a year is nothing. Things take longer, right? In this kind of industry. But I gave myself a year and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go at it. Balls to the wall. I'm going to throw everything at this. I got an agent really quickly. I got my first acting job, like my first tele acting job really quickly. And all of a sudden things were happening and then things stopped. 
And I was like, oh, okay, what do I do? And I went through a bit of a rough breakup and I did a comedy workshop because I was like, I don't want to look at my feelings. I don't want to process these feelings. Um, I was like, I just want to, I just want to stay busy. What can I do? Oh, I'll do this. I'll do this uh, writing workshop, right? We'll do this comedy writing workshop because it's free and my favorite price. So I was like, I'm going to go do this. And I went to do it. And I thought, because I never read the small print, because I'm too impatient for that. I thought it was a writing workshop and I was like, yeah, I might, have, you know, not really written, but I'll give it a go. It might be good to learn how to do something different um, and avoid my feelings at the same time. And um, and I turned up and it was Hardeep Singh Kohli who was running it. Ah, right. And I was like, what's he doing here? And he came in and he's like, all right, yeah, cool, right, we're doing stand up. And I was like, are you, I'm at the front, literally, notebook and pen, because I'm a grammar school girl, right at the front, like, right, teacher's pet. You know, I'm like all ready to make notes. And then all of a sudden he's like, no, we're all going to sit in a circle. We're all going to talk about like what experience we have of doing stand up. And everybody else had done stand up there, even if they'd only just done one gig. I didn't really even know what it was. Like, I, you know, might have watched it on telly, but I had no interest in it. Anyway, we did a few workshops. He was like, you've really got something. Keep writing, keep doing it. Obviously didn't take his advice for a couple of years because I was like, how do you do it? How many times do you open up a paper and it says stand up comedian wanted? I was like, how do you even like, do you know what I mean? I don't, there's yeah. no, there, you know, I was like, do I do a course? But all these courses are really expensive. And all this stuff in my personal life was like a totally down the shitter. Like, you know, I'd have to move back to home with my parents. I like, you know, was having, you know, real, I was diagnosed with like depression and anxiety. And I was like making sense of my life and it was just like a lot of change at the same time. And, and at the same time, my career wasn't going anywhere. Like, as I say, you know, I'm only hearing from my agent really rarely. And I'm like, well, what do I do now? I can't give up now. I just said that I was giving this a go. I can't give up. And then I started doing the odd gig here and there. And then um, I, the Asian network got in touch. And that was it, really. And then it's just kind of gone from there. So it was it was never the plan. It was pretty hairy in the beginning. And now I'm kind of just like trying not to my thing is control like I love I love to like just know exactly what's going on and like yeah, you know yeah. that's my main thing and you can't you can't be like that in the arts like you just do you know what I mean that's like I've got the worst personality to be in the arts really like <laughs> I'm always it's like, not oh, control but your, your, your career is not the uh, your, the career is not really one of control within that yeah absolutely it's you, just you're not- in control of the direction especially if you in, in that kind of space I'm guessing it's it's fairly limited anyway in terms of some yeah. of opportunity yeah 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 absolutely but to be honest uh you know that's something I've worked on personally and now I've just gone if you release control see what happens and then amazing opportunities come in because you're not tunnel vision just looking towards some end goal like oh my end goal is more the week it's like no there's so much more than that um so yeah it was never the plan um at all but here we are however for I think about four years ago I started or maybe five years ago I did my first gig so when when you were, when you were preparing to do your, your gigs and your first gigs where where were you practicing your kind of your material at the, at the time so like how many like in my room in my childhood it? bedroom at my parents house wow and there were your audience no no I did I genuinely didn't tell them for ages <laughs> I think people think I'm lying when I say this I didn't tell my parents for ages I was like are you kidding me I was like you know, when, when I went to drama school, they were like, what are you doing with your, do you know what I mean? They were like, mm. and I think they were like, right, well, fine. Okay. If you're going to do it. And because I'm stubborn, they're like, well, she'll get over it at some point. She didn't get over it. You know, they literally only found out because <laughs> I did the Asian network. And I was like, when it's done, and I didn't want to tell them before. Just that, were, they, were they part of the material and you didn't want to tell, <laughs> tell them? Partly that. But also partly because this was back in 2017. It was the first time I did it. I can't watch it now. It makes me cringe. Um, and um, somebody had seen it and they called my mum. And they were like, oh, she's on the telly. I mean, I was on the red button, but like, you know, yeah, same thing. Same thing. Same thing. So to them, they were like, she's on the telly. Are the jokes are on the TV? And I was like, oh, my God. And then my mum was like, the jokes are on the TV? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm telling jokes on TV. And then they watched it, and my mum was like, I don't like your hair, I don't like what you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always about encouragement. It's always a always, good Always. Oh, they've always been there. But you know what? I started this path, really, the creative path, when I was 18. And it's what I say to everyone, because they're like, oh, you know, my parents this, what are they going to do, what are they going to say? But I totally get it. It's like a valid concern. But my parents only, beginning of last year, 
and I was 36. So literally half my life it has yeah. taken them to get around. And that's only because, you know, I'm stubborn and I didn't stop doing it. And I was also like respectful. Um, and there's all, you know, I was really like, you know, I'm not going to, I was like, don't worry, I'm not going to bring shame on. I'm not like getting up on stage and getting nungy or anything. I was like, come and see me and you'll see what it's about. But you know what it is with our families as well and with our communities. Like as soon as other people think you're good, they start thinking you're good. Mm. You know, before then, my mum's like, oh, why, why are you making that face? Or why are you doing this? Or doing that? You know, whatever. As soon as, you know, she's Experts. at the doctor and someone's tapping her on the shoulder when she's having longer going, oh, Benji, she's very good. My mum's like, oh, I'm a new yeah, I know. And I'm like, yeah. Right. She learned from the best. She learned from the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the best thing was when they first saw me, it was in Gravesend, so it was in my hometown as well. And they came to see me. And my mum, I came out thinking oh, I'll probably see some girls I went to Punjabi school with you know it's a small town and um and I was like oh, well how do I avoid them and my mum was the one getting mobbed in the foyer because they were like oh you must be so proud you know auntie she did really well blah blah and my mum was in the middle surrounded my mum's having a moment right she's having her moment my mum's in the middle going oh, I'm in the I was like thank you bloody Abbott there was us there was us fighting all the stereotypes you know we were supporting yeah, our yeah. daughter yeah in it not me having stand up brows going this is what I'm going to do in my life you know what are you doing with it now but also you know and this is the thing that I always say to to people who come from especially from working class backgrounds regardless of colour because there's not that many of us in the arts I always say look we have to try find that balance between having compassion for our parents coming to this country at a certain point mm. in time when it, they had it really really tough and also but not letting that detract from the fact that we want to live our life the way that we want to live our life and I think that's I, that's a really tricky thing to do to go yeah my parents came over here in the 60s did all the shit jobs white people didn't want to do you know went and worked in the factories worked really really hard finally got to a stage where they were kind of comfortable enough to maybe buy their own property or whatever it was um, and they had it and, and doing that in the back drop of the racist 50s 60s 70s in this country as well as well as not really you know with my parents not really knowing the language not really you know having a support network here you know so of course when their daughter turns around and goes you know 18 years later goes oh yeah by the way I want to do something that has no job security I might never get paid for it it's, I have to work all the hours um they're going well I don't know this world for a start, I don't know what kind of people that you're going to be meeting or the kind of people you're going to be mixing in. Are you going to be taking advantage of, et cetera, et cetera. But they're also going, are you fucking kidding me? I worked my ass off. I gave you all this and you want to piss it up the wall. By <laughs> telling like, a joke. <laughs> yeah, by telling bloody, by trying to do bloody comedy. They're like, what kind of bloody job is this? Um, so I can completely, and also what will people say? So I completely get it. And I have compassion for them, you know, in nice respect that, you know, it's hard for them. It's hard for them to to kind of come around to it, man. I think, especially if you're not if you're not doing anything, which is kind of like stereotyped, stereotyped with the community of doing those kind of yeah. hard, hard brick, you know, those red brick kind of courses. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. They've almost got this kind of rhetoric, this all this narrative already of like an expectation of what kind of happens. Of course, and of if course. You, if you have, I, I kind of had something similar to that because I did a politics degree, and it was like, okay, so what are you going to do with that? You're going to be, gonna be prime that, minister. Gonna, exactly <laughs> that's it i had that you know but to be fair my parents never said anything to me it's to me it was everybody else basically yeah. saying like, you know yeah, what are you yeah. gonna and i had the only reason i kind of picked that course because i didn't have a clue what i wanted to do and it was just like uh, it was a way of like choosing a course and having so many options i, mm. I think i really fear that for the younger generation as well mm. because they, they've got to make choices for their careers, you know, when they're like 18, 20, that's going to dictate the next 40, 50 years of their yeah, life and absolutely. potentially their children's life as well. Yeah. And I just think, I, I think that's rough. It's terrifying. Like, I don't think, I don't think it should be allowed. No. Like, I don't think it should be, at 18, like, are you kidding me? At 18, when I think back to like, what I knew at 18, like, I could, I could, I could fold the back of an envelope with what I knew about life mm. at eighteen, and you want me to make a decision that's effectively going to, you know, impact, you know, the rest of my life potentially, you know, or at least the next whatever five to ten years. Yeah. Whatever. I just think I think it's so rough on on people, and I think, yeah, I, I, and also like I see what you're saying. The pressure from like extended, like you know, the wider community can be massive for our parents. Even if our parents are pretty cool, or yeah. maybe they're a bit more liberal, or they're maybe a bit more relaxed. 
you know, having that in your ear must be a lot. You know, it must be a lot of people are like, oh, what are they doing? What about that? And what about this? And what about that? And they're all already going, oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know anybody else who's done a politics degree. I don't know what kind of job, mm. you know, they want to do. And I think in my case as well, I didn't have like a, a, a proper job to go with it. So it wasn't like I was doing a nine to five and I'll do comedy at the weekends or whatever, you know, because I think that probably would have been more acceptable to them because yeah. then it's like a hobby. But I, I'm, I'm all or nothing, so. I, I, I kind of want to ask you, uh, um, a little bit of a tricky question really which is around mm-hmm. no it, it's around kind of like the, we're talking about the stereotypes and mm-hmm. like especially like stereotypes in comedy uh, i remember speaking to like a music artist and 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 how they define themselves as like are they a Bangla artist or this and this and they yeah. just class themselves as an artist yeah they can't really box themselves as being kind of a south asian mm-hmm. uh you know person in the in, in doing music do you see there's a danger that if you, if if artists coming through from South Asian background sort of just stay in that box and then they have that problem of what you're saying where they only get cast in certain roles and be booked in certain types of shows? Yeah, I mean that's 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 been an issue forever. You know, for many reasons, the people who are making decisions are white. They are white middle class men, producers, even the younger producers majority of them white middle class men so when they're commissioning stuff for tv they're going i don't really understand this can, can you can we look at it from a white person's perspective mm-hmm. you know there's loads of things there was a, an itv drama um about that that poor woman who got killed and they told the story from like the um police officer's perspective or the detective's perspective and i remember going it's not your story though this is not yours. This is about the story about that poor woman who got killed. But I was like, okay, fine. So, you know, a lot of people don't get. So when, when people say to me, oh, we've not had anything since goodness gracious me on TV. And I'm like, yeah, because the people who are making decisions will only want to do stuff like goodness gracious me, really, generally. Like now there are more kind of Asian commissioners in more people of colour who are like maybe at a decision making level. So from a casting perspective, if you're right as white, their perspective is going to be a lot like different to anybody else's, right? So of course, you know, if they're gonna go, like I, you know, I've, I've spoken to producers before when they've t- talked about how problematic it is, they'll put a cast forward for whatever show and they'll be like, oh, we need to diversify it. Okay, well, we've got a teacher here, let's make them black. We've got a doctor here, let's make them Indian. We've got, And they literally do that. But guess what? All those are little, little parts. They're never the need. When was the last time you put on the telly and you saw a show, mainstream, British show, comedy, drama, whatever, and the lead person was Asian, and it was nothing to do with honor killings or terrorism or arranged marriages. or, or Like, all of our stuff has to be issue-led and trauma-based. Yeah. We can't just be living a life. We can't just be a family, you know, living living our lives. We can't just be somebody having an affair or, do you know what I mean? Or, like, someone yeah. just getting married. You know, what, like, it's never normal life for us. It always has to be other because we're not seen as being quote unquote normal and mainstream so that's always going to be an issue I always get female comedian British Asian comedian Indian comedian I've got no issue with being any of those things but I don't want to see it written down and I don't want to be introduced as that because nobody goes oh please welcome to the stage uh white British male comedian Michael McIntyre true true and until they do that I'm not having it I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy I called you comic actor and writer first. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stop that now. But, because all of, all of this speaks for itself. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like when it's written down, when someone's writing about Peter Kay, nobody goes, oh, yeah, white northern male comedian, Peter Kay. It's like, you just go, yeah, Peter Kay, comedian. So the language, again, is is something that is it's another... Telling, right? is it, yeah, it's another battle in terms of stigma that, you know, to, to, to kind of fight yeah. through as well. Well, to kind of other you, right? To make you feel other. That's, that's yeah. what it is. Okay. And that, that's the thing that I've kind of just become really aware of in, in like the last kind of few years. And look, it, ask any comedian, ask any non-white comedian out there, whether they've been going for 10 years, whether they've been going for 10 minutes, every single one of them has had an experience in some way, shape or form when someone said to them, oh yeah, we'd love to have you on this gig, but there's already one of you on there. Mm-hmm. You normally get that in clubs. You know, when yeah. you used to go out in clubs, I, in, in, I think I kind of, ex, I'm just trying to relate it back to the kind of experiences of where that other you, what you've just said. Yeah. And there used to be like, you have to a, a queue for like all, all the glory going to the club. 
Yeah. And then there was another cue from there. Yeah. Oh, we got we got enough of you lot tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know take it easy and then yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be like one in four <laughs> yeah. one in one out kind of thing that's like Hollyoaks now isn't it they have like one in one out when it comes to brown people um <laughs> I, i'll just go but i think it was it was ironically i think sanjeev baskar was the last one is it unforgotten on itv yeah 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 but he yeah. was kind of uh, gone through but that that triggered off a whole new discussion as well because i remember sitting there going around goodness gracious me and, I, and i've kind of watched some of the recent ones yeah uh, i watched it back again Right. And, it, and it feels like a lot of the comedy sketches that you kind of see now, like are more on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it's literally yeah. the, the, that kind of stuff, like yeah. Indian accent. Anyone yeah. putting on an Indian accent now, all of a sudden they're going to start, you know, it, they're all, it's becoming very samey, samey. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and I think like in terms of like the comedy movement, there's, is there any, I think Paul Chowdhury is the uh, kind of like does kind of more darkish kind of, sort of stuff from from that way which, edgier. yeah 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 and yeah. i think you know i think that kind of stuff is very safe in terms of like yeah. doing, doing a doing an accent of, or dressing up as the dad and give, mm -mm -mm. I think but also how many like, times do you see paul chowdry on a panel show i mean not that he needs to do panel shows do you see what i mean it's like yeah, yeah. Kind of go, like he's he's incredibly successful sold out so many you know arenas and stuff sold out tours like you know and i'm a big fan but you kind of go, so we can't just have Paul Chowdhury and goodness gracious me, do you know? Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. That, that, you know, but also, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a certain level, this is me personally speaking, just from like comedians that I'm seeing, where you kind of have to whitewash yourself mm -hmm. in order to be mainstream. Yeah, I think that's what I meant by the by the the question when I first started off around like, do you box this pigeonhole yourself as being in the South Asian, or do you kind of like, what, what I'm not even going to use those labels. I'm a comedian, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And look, you know, me personally, I love doing the so-called Asian comedy nights. You know, they're mixed; yeah, it's a mixed yeah. audience, but I love doing them. I love it. It's the atmosphere. It's great. It's you know, people find it relatable. People find it funny. You know, it's like it very much feels like it's your people. When I do my show, when I do my solo show, like 90% of the audience is Asian. It's bloody brilliant. It's also brilliant when they're not. <laughs> do you know, mm. it's just a very different atmosphere and a really different vibe. And no one's sitting in the front row with boxes of Tupperware. You know? <laughs> I broke it. It happened. Literally happened. <laughs> it, it, it will happen, especially when your your first gig uh, on your on your tour that's been rearranged now. Life yeah. of sucks. Is that right? Life on sucks. The, yeah. No, your life sucks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had it crossed out on, on, on there for a second. Now I'll put it on there. It must have been on Wednesday's episode. Um. So you're starting off in Sutton. Yes. Which is almost it, it, it's almost like the Windsor of Birmingham now. This is what I'm hearing. Yeah, this is yeah. what I'm hearing. So my promoter was like, because I was like, why? I said, we've got shows in Birmingham. Sutton Coalfield seems like a really niche place yeah. to go. And he was like, oh, it's a different, it was like, it's a different crowd. And essentially he was like, it's kind of like a, like a posher kind of version of. So I was like, well, if you're guaranteeing that I am going to marry somebody rich. Um, You'll find them there. <laughs> It's either that or they've done it. It's either that or they, they've definitely done a VAT scam. So, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're I'm up for both of those things. I'm up yeah. for both of those things. I'm like single, rich, got a heart condition. Let's go. Like, let's. <laughs> 84 years old. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's good. It's good. I'm good. Um, yeah, I'm really excited, actually. I think Birmingham, I, I'm, I've seen, a, a, I saw Chris Rock when he, when he came oh, to Birmingham really? a few years ago. Um, and I, I would say, like, the, it's just like a Drake concert. It's just full of opera. <laughs> It's just like, like, you know, I mean, I'm, that was why I see uh, Frankie Boyle. So that was quite a lot. Of, and that was in, he was in Dudley, which was, yeah. uh, so that, um, Jimmy Carr. I think yeah. Jimmy Carr was more kind of more 50-50, but um, mm -hmm. I think you, you, you'll be, you'll be kind of be surprised when, when you, when you come there and you see. So yeah, I've been, I've been uh, shouting it about to a few people coming to like, Sutton, just come and sign here. Oh, you know, thank you, know, you. You know the same place where you get your flu, where you get your thank vaccination. She's there. It's going to be that same. They're currently. It's great because people, you then don't have to travel anywhere else. It's all local. Yeah. It's, I mean, um, I mean, essentially that even like the, the diaspora of in terms of, what Birmingham and, and you were talking about your first generation like your, your parents coming over grandparents so on um a lot of people are essentially just blow, getting out of those kind of yeah. those areas and um you you're seeing the makeup of it um mm. definitely because I even I take my kids to school around here and um and I, I recognize some people and I was like oh dear, I remember you 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 know like 
and now look at you, you know, you know, and, you know and, and you're getting the same people telling you the same, like you, they're thinking that of, of you. It. What yeah. the hell are you doing here? Who did you? <laughs> You know, what did you inherit? You know, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, who did you scam to get that big house with the black and gold gates with the lions on it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's gone now because see, it's different now because I think as people are getting older and they go into nicer areas, yeah, there's a competition of this season now where they were like, well, I, I came here ten years ago, and then they'll yeah. be like, I was here, I was one of the first ones here, and oh. uh, you know, so I, I know it, I know it better than you. But they also don't talk to each other. Like just... I mean, nothing changes, right? It's that same mentality, whether you're in Punjab, whether you're like right in the middle of Soho Road, whether you're like now moving out to Sutton Coalfield, like it is, the mentality stays the same, doesn't it? Mm, mm. That tribal mentality stays the same. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's uh, the, tri- the tribalism, the tri- tribalism is funny. But I think the younger generation is just like, it, you can just see some of the nicer places just around Birmingham or West Midlands or kind of the more leafy ones. You, you kind of when you see one up right there, like ah, oh, I ain't going there again. It's, 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 it's getting taken over. Now. I'm gonna go. To, I'm gonna go. Far, I'm gonna go further out. I'm gonna go. Oh further. my god! <laughs> it's, it is hilarious. I mean, it's all it's all in good jest to be honest. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also, good luck getting a cab. Uh, well, uh, oh, we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll give you all the logistics a little bit later on. So we we we, we can we can show show that right. <laughs> You 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 told then so you 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 originally had it kind of scheduled last year is yeah is that right so then what was it, some of the difficulties that you that you faced on there because you you know like you're putting something together on a national uh, on a national mm. level um, it's more professional than you know that you that you'll see some artists or, or yeah. other comedians doing what was the logistics and some of the kind of the tricky decisions you had to come to well to be honest we me and my promoter so I work with um, this is central and um with a guy called Altaf Sawa so it's like it's just us two really and then, well he's got a small team as well but like we're the main kind of people we um he basically said to me because he saw me on the Asian network and we play put me on all these gigs and I said and he said do you want to do a half an hour with another comedian like you do half an hour they do a half an hour and I was like no not really I want to do my own show and he and I'd already I'd, I'd already been up to Edinburgh and I had a show but I wanted to do a different one I wanted to and I was like, I've got enough material. And I think I think I've got something important that I want to say. Like I'm not just doing it for the sake of it. I've got yeah. something I want to talk about. And I, you know, and um, and he was like, mm, it's a bit risky. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he went, I tell you what, he said, Let, let's do four dates. We'll go to small rooms, we'll do four dates. That means if it doesn't really go anywhere, we won't we won't take too much of a hit on it and it won't be too much out of your your time. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just slowly went up and up and up and up. And then by the time we actually started, I think we were on something like 20 dates or something like that by the time we started. And we started end of January 2020. Obviously, no idea about what COVID was back then. Yeah. We did a few shows. There were some rumblings around it. But obviously, people were like, oh, it's in China. Oh, it's in Italy. Oh, it's fine. Don't worry. It's over there. No one's going to. It's not like we've got planes where people travel and, you know, go to other countries and spread this shit. Or everything is bought from those countries that you order right? from Amazon. So I was like, oh, man, OK. Um, I was like, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. And then we were at Belgrade in Coventry and I was about to go on. I think it was about five or ten minutes just before I was about to go on. And I was all ready, I was all ready to go. And he just came backstage and he just turned the little tannoy off in the dressing room and he just went... Because he's a, he's a good one for prank, playing pranks as well. So he was like, look. And I was like, oh, man. I was like, don't play a prank with me now. I'm about to go on stage. And he's like, no, no, no. He said, I'm not. He was like, I'm not joking. The venue's decided to pull the show. Boris Johnson's just made an announcement. Um, and I was like, that venues have to close. And I was like, I've never had a stress experience like it. I was instantly, I just went completely hot, completely cold. And then I just felt like I had ants all over me. I was just like, I, I think my, I just freaked out. Like I was fine to look at and I just freaked out. And then I just cried. I just burst into tears. And so lovely. So many audience members were DMing me going, we're in Bella Italia across the road. Come and join us. Cause we're having a night out anyway. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm here. I'm here. My master's here. My mom's here. My sister's, my cousin's at home. It's just like, I was crying in my dressing room. My phone's going mad. And um, obviously we didn't know what was going to happen then. I basically, I pretty much went to bed for two months. 
like I pretty much just like my mental health took a real nosedive like it did for a lot of people do you know what I mean like and also for me it was heartbreaking because I was a few shows in I was just finding my stride I was loving getting into the routine of it I was getting amazing feedback from people I was like we were like cool let's do more maybe we go international maybe we you know it's, it's going really well and I think pretty much all the dates have sold out at this point so that I mean that was the biggest thing and then it was like when do you do it when do you not do it? and even now like yeah we've rearranged everything even now I'm like am I going to be performing to 50 people all in masks all socially distanced and now I've just gone you know what it's not in your hands it's not up to you I want to do this show it's a show I'm really passionate about for so many different reasons um yeah so it's been a lot it's been it's been a lot but the, you know what's been really touching and what's kind of kept me going is the amount of people that just that would like don't worry don't worry about refunds I could probably count on one hand the amount of people who asked for a refund across the whole tour because they were like, we don't care. We'll come see you. doesn't matter when it is. doesn't matter if it's this year, next year, whenever. They were like, it's fine. That's think, uh, but that's a, proper, that's a kind of like a proper fan base as well, isn't it? That's that. You were talking about that. that yeah, I, I can't even talk about it because I'll get emotional because, I, you know, I kept saying to people, have your money. Take your money. I was like, I'm not going to run away to Bali with it. I was like, I'm not, don't worry. I'm not going to put a deposit down on a house or anything like that much. But like, I was like <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not nicking your money. Like, please, like, if you want to have a refund, go get a refund, get, you know, and we were just like, no questions asked, you know, do it. Doesn't matter. You can always rebook at a later date, but you know, and times are hard for a lot of people. You know, you're booking for like five, ten people to come. That's a that's a nice chunk of change. So, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really heartening and overwhelming to know that people were still like. Because I think the other thing is when you're in the arts, and if you're at a certain level, or if you're if you feel like you're gaining some sort of traction, and people kind of know who you are. In the back of my mind, I was like, no one's going to come over, come see me again. Because by the time this is over, the, you're, you're wondering the momentum's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, they're going to forget. Yeah. They're going to. No one's going to know because why would they? Why would I ever think that people know who I am or that you know I have? A, even like you saying the word fan base makes me feel so uncomfortable. Like because it just, I'm, I don't like it. I don't, I'm like, no, 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 it's not. That's that's weird. Um, and that's not to say that people can't be fans. I just it makes me feel so uncomfortable. But but yeah, logistically, yeah, that was a nightmare. Now, thankfully. People didn't forget who I was, which was nice. People, you know, we've moved all those tickets across. We've added <laughs> so many more dates. We're still adding dates. Um, so, yeah, so I think um, it's, yeah, it's going well. Starts in September and we're going up until end of February. So it's a nice, what, six months or whatever. So it starts on the 3rd of September at, at yeah. Sutton and then it, it goes out there. So, the, the, um, I mean, all the I'll put on the link um, in Thank the description you. of where, where to get tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we got it from. So you, that, that, that material that you had was kind of ready in for like 2020. Um, mm -hmm. Have you kind of worked on sort of like your, your yeah. next bit of material and, and what? Yeah, that I don't I don't want to change the core of the show. I don't want to change the core message of a show because I think that is still, you know, very pertinent. In fact, it's probably, it's probably even more relatable now considering what people have gone through over the, the last year or so. Obviously, I want to reflect what's also going on in the world. But I'm not going to do a show about lockdown. I'm not going to talk about COVID. Like, we've all lived through it. Do you know what I mean? You're not going to be go up there going, oh, my God, do you remember lockdown? It's like, yeah, we only just came out of it last week. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, so there'll be some things that I want to say about it. But, yeah. And there'll be bits that... And also, like, I don't know about you, but everybody I know, I can certainly speak for myself when I say this, I'm not the same person that I was when lockdown began in March 2020. Like, I'm just not. I'm just, you know, my priorities have shifted. My life looks different. I feel different about certain things. You know, we've had a lot of time to reflect. You know, maybe some people are. Maybe some people are, you know. Yeah, I've not changed at all. But I feel like a profoundly different person to who I was back then. So when I finally sit down and I go back, at, you know, look over the show at the beginning of next month, uh, when I really start prepping it, working on it, previewing it and stuff, um, I, it's going to be a different show in a way. Mm. You know, it's going to, because, you know, it, it will be, because I'm a different person. And, it, you know, your comedy has to reflect that. Your art has to reflect who you are, or it does reflect who you are. So where do you get a chance to kind of test the, 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 the new material out, apart from your bedroom? Is no. it, like, <laughs> I mean, do you go, is there any, is there like a, a, a strong uh, improv underground scene or? Uh, well, there's a there's comedy scene, obviously, in terms of like new material nights. Mm. So, you know, if a lot of comedy buffs go to see them anyway, you know, because they're like, some people love that because they get to see a bit behind the scenes. They get to see, you know, a comedian up there with a clipboard 
or with a bit of paper or just stuff written on their hand trying to work it out and um yeah so new material nights other gigs that I do you know it's it's a terrifying thing to do I've got an acting background so I'm always used to having a script that has been the biggest challenge for me is to mm. go I'd write something and perform it tomorrow night and you might fall on your ass <laughs> and that's fine um but I actually I was lucky enough uh, Sarah Millican got in touch with me over lockdown and asked me to do her gig that she used to do like every Wednesday called Playground and this gig was so brilliant it didn't stay online anywhere you had to do new material every time you could maybe start it or end it with something that you know already works the rest of it had to be brand new material like though that was the criteria of the gig and when I tell you I shat myself yeah. <laughs> I was like Sarah Millican like my comedy hero she's there like you know Gary Delaney also brilliant comedian there they're both like you know they're both at the end you know they're both like headlining whatever and there's me going oh shit I can't fall on my ass I can't fall on my ass but comedy is about falling on your ass like you have to fail the only thing is I mean we all have complicated relationships with failure especially those of us who grew up with like very extreme expectations from their parents but when you have to fail publicly in this way that's that's the bit I've struggled the most with comedy not the not really getting gigs or whatever or the traveling yeah okay fine that's you know sometimes that can be a bit much but but the, the thing that really gets to me is that if I fall on my ass there are witnesses <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll get you. I'll you, get know, you. Like, well, you know, like when you're on the street and you trip over, even if you trip over it like that, does and anyone see me? Yeah, or, or you pretend that there was something wrong with your with your train, or you just yeah. hold your yeah, ankle. yeah, yeah. You're doing that, or, or you check your phone, or you know, or even like even I do it sometimes. If I'm walking a certain way and I'm realizing I'm going the wrong way, I make a big show of it. I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to go this way. It's like it's fine. No one's fucking looking at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or you, so, or you pretend you get your phone. The pretend phone call is yeah. probably the, the ben, biggest benefit of the mobile phone. Exactly. Lifesaver in yeah. so many situations. What was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, cool. oh, no, yeah, I'm playing that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to play that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that, that is. So, logistically, I'm really lucky. I've got a brilliant producer. He keeps me in the loop. He knows that I'm a, he knows that I need to be all over everything all the time. And logistically, yeah, obviously with COVID and everything, it's been hard for everyone. It's been hard to get venues in. Mm. Venues have folded in that time, you know. Yeah. You know, venues have gone, venues have gone, we're booked now until 2023, sorry. Can't have your show back. So people who are like, come to my little town here. I'm like, mate, we can't. You're going to have to travel. You have to get up off your ass, freaky. Like, get on a train. <laughs> That's it. Exactly, exactly. You come, for a, yeah, come, you, come, you come for a wedding. Come here. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You fucking do. You travel to Glasgow for you know, your whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just for stale samosa and fucking t- you know, gone off last night and like and now like get on it anyway. Not to say that you can't get nice food in Glasgow, but uh, that's fine. Uh, I mean, like, so y- your relationship with the, the other parts of the arts in terms of like your actor and, and your writing skills. So, did you have? I know you, you're coming out with a, a, a novel as well. Is that yeah, is that right? So right. When, when's that scheduled in for now? Uh, so that's now March the 3rd, next year. 2022. 2022, so just after my tour, it comes out. And so, like, obviously not giving too much away, but what was the what was the kind of thinking around it? It's called Sunny, is that right? Yeah, yeah it's called Sunny, yeah. And that, that's, the, that's the name of the protagonist, that's the name of the, the main character. It, it's very loosely, I have to say this, it's very loosely, because otherwise people are going to read it and go, did this happen to you? And I'll be like, no, oh. I just, uh, it's not autobiographical, it's not my memoirs. <laughs> um, but it is... You know, I was really lucky and this did, it saved me in lockdown. The tour got cancelled, obviously no gigs. Online gigs had just started. And I was like, no, <laughs> so no why would I do that? Um, and, I, and I lost all my work and all, all production and acting work had halted. And I was like, I've gone from working, being on the road all the time, being really lucky enough to be working all the time to absolutely nothing. And now I'm here going, oh, better make some banana bread. Um, and I just very randomly just got an email from my agent at the time and was like, they were like, oh, just just got an email from this publisher do you want to write a book and I was like is this a joke um and I was like yeah but I didn't think I'd do this until I was like much much older you know maybe when I was about to retire or I'd had enough of being on the road or whatever I was like I'm gonna go move to the seaside I'm gonna start you know wearing crazy clothes and start drinking wine heavy. exactly start drinking wine at midday like you know just you know just live my best life right grow old disgracefully and I'm gonna write books 
And uh, anyway, got talking to this editor, this editor who's now a really good friend of mine, Sarah Adams. She, um, unbeknownst to me, life is, works out in so many amazing, wonderful, weird ways, had seen me do stand up. She came to see a play that I wrote years ago, like back in 2017. And she'd always kind of remembered me. And then she kind of, you know, went to work for this publisher and, 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 and they were like, you know, bring on some new authors. And she was like, I think she could write a book. And she basically pitched me to them. I didn't know any of this. Was it the FBI actually? Yes, the FBI actually was the so play. So yeah. did you write that as well then? At that so she obviously knew that from the, yeah. you've, you've got those skills to do that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Although obviously writing a play in a, in a novel in a is very is different. Like, as she keeps telling me, she's like, you have to tell the reader what's going on. And I'm like, oh. I was like, they could fill in the gaps. <laughs> Imagination, that's, that's yeah. what's beautiful. Readers need to work harder, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to writing for stage and like, all like my own performance. Obviously, so much of communication is non-verbal, right? right? So so when I'm writing, when I was writing my play or like when I'm working on projects at the moment for telly or whatever, I can just be like, oh, so-and-so standing there, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, actors fill in the gaps. It's fine. You know what they want. Um, but anyway, the book is called Sunny. It's about a woman, a British Punjabi woman who moves back in with her parents at 30, very traditional uh, parents at 30. And uh, she's in this kind of dead end job working customer services. You know, she doesn't really like it. She doesn't really like, she's kind of in that weird space where she's like, feels like, you know, she's single, she was with someone, didn't work out, her friends are like being good thing out a little bit, you know, they're being, you know, being bitchy a little bit and she kind of feels like she doesn't really, no one really gets her and she just feels a bit lost and there's no kind of real blueprint for her because she's like, well... This is not an autobiography, right? At this no, no, it's really not, I promise yeah. it's not, my friends are lovely, my friends, yeah. <laughs> my friends are lovely, don't worry, um, and, you know, I, and I, luckily I don't have a dead-end job, but um, she, she's kind of like in this weird situation where she's like, oh, she just, then she just goes on all these dates, right, she's like, sod it, I'll have, to, I'll have something to do, right, goes on all these dates, They're, most of them are dickheads, but she's doing, she's living like a lot of us have lived, or some of us are still living, a double life, essentially. So her mum doesn't know any of this stuff. Mum doesn't know that she's dating. You know, she's doing the whole, like, well, I better put my hair up when I come back in. I better wipe my makeup off, you know, when I come back into the house. And her mum catches her one day um, on a date. And she's like, shit, this is it. I'm going to get disowned. I'm going to get thrown out. Like, this is like, this is like, you know, because, you know, that's not, that's not what you do. And her mum surprises her and says, all right, well, if you're going to live here, you're going to live here under our roof, the rule is I want to know who you're meeting. And then her mum is then swiping for her <laughs> on Tinder and she's like, what is like, what is my life? Why is my mum doing, do you know what I mean? And, uh, and I don't know if you know about Tinder, but some of those photos are not PG. And um, so she... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I genuinely have no idea, but I, I, you hear enough about it, yeah. yeah. You hear enough okay. about it. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, you're lucky enough that you've never had to go on it. Um, so she's, so she's, so basically, you think it's a story about a woman who's at a, quite a low point, who's also got undiagnosed mental health stuff going on, which is not really sure what it is, but just trying to find her way in life. And you think, oh, it's going to be a love story because she's meeting all these guys, and this guy might be a thing, and this might be a, guy might be a thing. You think that's going to be a love story, and actually. The real love story is really between her and her mum. You know, it, it's about them kind of coming together and and figuring out their relationship now. She's an adult. I, I mean, you don't really. I mean, it is obviously art imitating life at, at that yeah, stage, yeah, yeah. and you and you and you're seeing it. I mean, within that kind of sphere of writing, is there many other kind of writers who talk about some of these things that you read? That you read about, or do you? Probably, I don't read. <laughs> you don't read them, yeah. I don't, do you know what? I've been so worried that I'm accidentally going to copy, copy what someone, you know, like when you're, when you're writing something and someone talks to you and then you start writing what they're saying rather than writing what you're supposed to be writing. Mm. That's what I'm really worried about. I'm like, I don't, if I read like other modern romantic comedy fiction, I was like, what if I accidentally put that in my book? So I kind of stayed away from it. I've basically just been reading crime. <laughs> I'm like, what can I find that is the absolute opposite of this crime, gritty crime drama? Saying that's, your... that's just like all of Netflix anyway. You can, I'm sure if you just subconsciously just like, yeah, yeah I can nick some of that. Yeah. Of, no, like, I get so that. worried. I get so worried. But but the thing is, because because it is you know loosely based on my experiences, sure. no one can really be like, oh, you nicked it, because I'm like, it's my fucking life. <laughs> you know? Let's just say if they nicked it, so show me where from. Oh, you do it. 
Is yeah, 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 absolutely. Like... Yeah, absolutely. That's why that's why when I do comedy, I'm like, I know if someone's in it my material because it ain't going to work for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got the stamp. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so it tells me like kind of your writing there, your acting kind of area that you've gone into. <laughs> um, you know, is there films? What's on, kind of on the horizon? That's um, yeah. it's, made, it's been telly up until this point. Um, I'm doing bits and pieces of that. Acting is like... The, the reason I don't get on with acting, I love doing it. Actually, I, I did something that's out now. I did a little ad for PlayStation, which I think is on YouTube. But PS5, moment. can you get to? Huh? Yeah, for the PlayStation 5? Yeah, no, for, um, for a new game. Oh, for a it's game within it. Or Clank, something Clank and Rift or Rift and something. I don't know. I don't I'm know. Just, I I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to pretend like I know what you're talking about. Just in yeah, case yeah, it's yeah. A yeah. Big game. Just, I thought yeah. you were about to Google it. I was like, don't watch it now. Um, Let me have a look, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Clank. Clank. Just put in, yeah, or Rift or something like that. I don't know. It's got weird now. I don't, you can tell I don't play games. Not like that, anyway. Oh, right. Yeah. Ratchet Clank. <clears throat> yeah, not Rift. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, actually. Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart. There we go. I knew it. I knew it was, it was in there somewhere, in my brain somewhere. Initial release date was the 11th of June. That's it. Do you reckon they'll give you some money for plugging it? Probably, probably not, though. No. They didn't give me much money for being in what it. What did you have to do then within the, in the gaming? What was that weird? Like, or was it just voiceover? Or? No, it wasn't. You, you'll see it. I'm in, I'm in the ad. You'll see my, you'll see my face pop up briefly. Um, but yeah, like, the thing is about acting is, for me, it's a lot of waiting around for the phone to ring. I'm not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, honestly, if I was just doing acting, I would have given up years ago and never gone back to it because it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my time? I just can't book a holiday, you know, can't say, I can't make plans because you're like, oh, an audition might come up or something might come up. Just got to be free all the time. Absolutely. No, thank you. Um, but, you know, I love acting. I would love to do more of it. Um, I would love to write another play. The theatre is my first love, you know, because it's live. Anything can happen. Um, and, and TV and film, I love screen because what you see when you're doing it is not what you see on screen yeah. at all. And I love the magic of that, how you can make something, which is essentially you're in a little cardboard box, make it look amazing when it comes on screen. Like the magic of it is, is yeah, really appeals to me. When you were talking earlier on about, like, you know, life on the road, it can be kind of isolation and, you know, mm-hmm. you, you, how, do you, how do you kind of combat that yourself now? Um. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens when I go back on the road, really, because um, I've not really had that opportunity. I think, I, th- I mean, look, some people love it. You know, some people are like, yeah, I love living off Tesco meal deal sandwiches. Yeah, I love being on the road all the time. I love it. And I'm sometimes I'm a bit like, I quite like my home comforts or I quite like, you know, I quite like this. I think, um, you know, obviously I don't like every, every day to be the same. Otherwise, I wouldn't, you know, otherwise I'd be we'll be doing this job all day um it's a lot in terms of your uh emotions just or in terms of just you as a person it's a lot of this it's a lot of up and down and up and down and sometimes that can get exhausting but that's not for everyone some people thrive off that I kind of go adrenaline 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 go 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 crash. crash yeah and I think sometimes that for me on a personal level sometimes I have to make sure okay, don't go out after every gig <laughs> or don't stay up talking shit with the other comedians. Do you know what I mean? On all that kind of stuff, it's like, go to bed at a certain time. Now I know myself. Now I know that if I'm doing a gig, it's gone really well and I've got loads of adrenaline, I'm not going to sleep till three, four in the morning. And that's, that's my body. And it takes me a while to wind down. I can do a shower with lavender shower gel. I can do my sleep spray. I can do all, I can do my meditation. I can do, I'm just not going to sleep till that time because my body is like a coiled spring. When that calms down, I calm down. I just have to be like, make sure you drink enough water, make sure you're, you know, make sure you check in with your friends because it can be really isolating. And sometimes you forget that there's a whole world outside. It's not just you and a show. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not saving lives. I'm not, like, going down a mine, am I? Um, so I'm also, like, trying to keep that into perspective. <laughs> no, I get I get what you mean, because in terms of like, when you're, when you're performing, and I think kind of, like, it's like, it's like physical um, sport, isn't it? It's like yeah. the, the cool down, yeah. that's, that's just as important because yeah. where you kind of go through. I, mm. I mean, when you're going in with, when you do talk with other kind of comedians, what kind of, what are you cautious about not giving too much stuff away if, if, in case of, or how does that atmosphere work? 
what in terms of material and stuff yeah yeah um no i mean comedians really just only care about themselves <laughs> <laughs> and I give a shit what you're talking about. I, I mean, I'm, I'm pro- I think a lot of people probably think that I'm uh, a bit snooty or I kind of like, you know, oh, I don't really want to mix with other people. The thing is, I get I get really bad anxiety. Like, it's not just nerves. Like, you know, I get really, really anxious to the point where, like, I'm feeling sick to the point of where I'm like, you know, not in a good space. And to do that, I just have to kind of take myself off and just do some breathing and to just be in my own space. So if I'm like having a comedian talking at me, like while I'm trying to get, I'm just, I can't do that. Like I, so, but that's something you learn as you do it. You learn your little coping mechanisms, you learn what you need and stuff. Maybe once we're back on the road, once we're gigging a bit more, I can be a bit more relaxed. But it used to be the case that I wouldn't sleep for days before I had a gig right at the beginning. I wouldn't sleep for days. I wouldn't eat anything on the day. Um, So I'm a little bit better with that now as well. But I'm still, I'm also like, right at the beginning of my comedy career so I'm also still figuring loads of stuff out but yeah I mean some comedians are like yeah I'll have three pints go on have a chat some like literally some comedians I've seen they'll be chatting at you at the side of the stage and they'll be like yeah right, I'm just gonna I just put this here I'm just gonna go do my set and I'm like oh my god how do you do that you know and then there's me and I'm like pacing up and down and up and down and up and down doing doing some nervous poos you know or, and I'm like running around going oh my god I'm not what about what if my mouth goes dry on stage I need a bottle of water you know I'm that guy backstage yeah. um so yeah but you'll have a process the um I mean like going through your experience of what you're doing now uh you 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 do have your kind of your reflective moments do you yeah. and, and it's easy to know some some artists might be one to kind of help nurture the scene around them is a kind of a legacy thing some people say oh, I just want to concentrate on myself what 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 camp do you fit in um I would yeah I think um I would love to I think I don't think you need to get so something I've been thinking about it's quite recently so it's quite relevant um I've been thinking about legacy I've been thinking about how to make things easier for people who are coming up you know because it is really difficult um, and what I would want that to look like. And I think in my head, and maybe other people feel like this as well, it feels like you have to get to a certain position before you can start paying it forward. Sure. And uh, I don't think that's true. I think every level that you're at, you have you have something to give to someone. You can, you know, you have the gift of insight, of reflection, of experience. So, you know, there's a, there are mentors for different levels. You know, you might get to a certain point, you might be like, I've kind of outgrown that mentor. Maybe I need somebody who's on a certain different level or, you know, has experience in a certain part of, you know, this industry. So I think, yeah, I I think it's hard to strike a balance maybe between focusing on yourself and the whole legacy side of things. My dream is, um, which came to me quite recently, I was like, that's what I want, is that at some point, I would love to be able to be in a position where, I mean, drama school fees are ridiculous and, you know, I would love it if in some way they were regulated, but I don't know how that works because, you know, a lot of people are making money off poor students who probably should be at drama school anyway. Um, um, I would love to offer like scholarships to students who come from like lower socioeconomic backgrounds, like people who can't afford to go, because I, I think there's a lot of raw talent out there. I think there's like a lot of people out there who can't do it because of money, because it's whatever nine grand a year or something like that, you know, yeah. plus you have to live in London for most of them, you know. So I would love to be in a position where I could offer support, financial support to those, to people, like even if it's just one a year for, for a drama school. Do you do you feel like I mean it's a, I, I'm not I'm not throwing this accusation at uh, them individually, but the goodness gracious me movement when it was happening at the time. Do you think that's where it kind of uh, where it, it failed that the the momentum sort of stopped and there wasn't nothing done afterwards? Yeah, I think it stalled definitely, like you say. I mean, the fact that we're twenty years on and we're still talking about it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's the thing that we're talking about, and that you know, and I've worked with some of them before, and they're really really lovely people. And um, but also it's such a big mantle to put on someone's shoulders to be like, what are you going to do now? Do you know what I mean? And they're like, well, we're actors and comedians. We just we just want to like pay pay our mortgage and like, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe maybe have a family, like buy a house. I don't know. Like, you know, I think um, it's a real shame that it did kind of stall there. And there's been it was so of its time as well. It's so iconic. Maybe we're being unfair and giving it too much of an onus if we're still always harking back to it. It's like so Pongra, least, it's like Pongra when everyone just talks about, oh yeah, I remember music back in those days, it was much yeah. better. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always say, in any artist, any 
this is a mass generalization um but an artist's early stuff is always the best stuff because that was when it was where they were exploring and going through there when they were um, hungry yeah exactly Quite literally sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so it, you know you, you create fruit but yeah i think when i look back on it good for me and it's just my opinion i don't want to get shot um <laughs> but it's a uh, I think it's aged badly in some of it as well, um, but it was it was relevant at that at that time. I remember I went to go see him live at the Hippodrome as well. Oh wow! Yeah, so and uh, I think that's where I got I got kind of dis- I think where my kind of um, annoyance comes from there because they were performing the sketches that I already knew, and I was like, yeah. and it was just my naivety in comedy to say that you know it, it's it's okay for them to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just thought you know. You, oh, it's all going to be new stuff. Yeah, yeah. You just tell a joke. Come on, the next thing and stuff like that. But I was young, yeah. Um, so I, I kind of uh, understood it from, from that bit. But yeah, yeah. I think you're right to uh, to say that it's just all on them. It's just it, it, yeah. And also, like like you said about Bangla music as well. Like I'm guilty of saying that of being like I'm not listening to anything post 2000 do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm purely just listening to Sajid Bindarakia from now until I die like yeah. you know um I think what we do by that is we then don't really open our eyes and our minds to newer artists you know so what we're kind of because we're so stuck in that going this is amazing we're not going this is amazing and mm. and I think maybe that's where we need to go we need to go goodness gracious me was amazing and okay, well, what do we do now? You know, well, what can we do now? And the one thing I would say is that when people are always like, oh, why aren't so-and-so, why don't why don't we have more Asian comedians on telly? Why don't we? And I'm like, you know what you need to do is support live comedy. Because that's the route on to getting onto telly. You're to getting work permission, to writing for telly. To, so, it's like, so if you're kind of going, oh, we don't want to go and see Asian comedians, but we want to see them on telly. It doesn't work like that. That's not how the pipeline works. Do you need telly now? I mean, like, for example, uh, some of the kind of popular comedians that I've seen, like Just Rain, for example. Mm. R- Russell Peters, I would say, is kind of like, our class him as old school, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, now, I guess. but, you know, like, Just Rain, Sankhtar is a new guy. Uh, one guy who's just just nuts is this Katapa TV. I see him on Instagram. <laughs> he is crazy. Um, AK TV, you know, like, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's loads of loads of them. I mean, they haven't. They've got. They're starting to get big, big followings yeah, of because of this all social media. The, the social media following. Do you think like that's the avenue where people were saying like, I don't really need TV anymore. I could just build it, put the tours in myself. Yeah, look, loads of people do that. Loads of people do that, and I think the beauty of doing that is we've all got phones. Yeah. Do you know? You know, we can all record stuff on our phones and put it online, put content online, but if you don't want that kind of career then I'm afraid you still got to go old school and pound the pavements and do your, do your, you know, pre gigs for no money or, you know, 20 quid in expenses. Or whatever. Yeah. But you know, and also I'm somewhere in the middle because mm. I'm also not about this struggle culture of, well, you have to be doing this for 20 years and then maybe somebody might take notice of you because I'm like, well, my seventh gig was on the Asian network or eighth gig or whatever. So like, I'm kind of going backwards with it because I'm like, I've done the TV stuff. But now I want to get really, really good at it. I want to hone my craft and I want to gig as much as possible yeah. and do as much live work as possible so that, you know, I can just get better. I just want to improve within myself um, as, as an artist, as a comedian. So I think some people are really happy doing that. And look, the money those guys can, you know, pull in and stuff like is huge if that's what you want to do. But I think if you're like me and you're like, my love is live performance, that's what I want to focus on. Also, there's so much, the, the amount of people who message me going, why don't you just put a sketch on um, on YouTube? Why don't you do that? I'm like, I don't have the time. Mm. Do you know how much time it takes? Not just the filming of it. That's the bit that takes about two, you know, that doesn't take that long. But, you know, the prep, the setup, the everything, the editing, the putting it out there, the pushing. I'm like, this is a lot of time. Like for a lot of those guys and like TikTokers as well, that's their full time job. I think That's it's. How doing. I've got three uh, jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know what you mean about the whole editing and the content and stuff. And like, yeah. it, it's just like it. 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 It take. It, it does take. It, it's the kind of unexpected area. It is expected, yeah. but you know, for how much it does take up. I think yeah. just going about, just thinking about what you were saying there. It's the kind of the appliance of art mixed with the appliance of an algorithm now. Mm. In terms, of, you know, to to get that kind of happy medium of where. 
Absolutely. I think I think in any any area of work now, um, yeah. it's just something that you just can't you can't you can't avoid. Mm. I think also like you know, art doesn't always have to be commercialized. True. You know, and I think maybe that's something that we need to think about as well. Like you, you shouldn't. Good point. You know, if you're not making money off your art, off your comedy, off your music, doesn't mean that you're not a musician or you're not an artist or you're not a comedian. You still are. Like, let's not measure our success or our value by how much money we're making off our art, because really, that's that's not what it should be about. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. No, I get what you mean. I do. I, I was just kind of mixed in another thought while you were just talking. Oh, I, I kind of got into my my own kind of rambling as well. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, you know, you said like you did your seventh gig was the Asian Network one. Yeah. Was it because that, like, I'm not saying in a negative way, was it because there wasn't that many kind of like areas of uh, different, uh, there wasn't a wide choices of people who were working in those things? And it was very. No, there's loads of Asian comedians. No, what, what I mean by that is like in terms of like timing, because they do, Asian Network doesn't get enough credit in some aspects. I think it does, yeah. it does wonderful. Uh, it does. Sometimes I feel it doesn't just get, it doesn't get the pulse right of, of the yeah. particular area. What I'm saying is, like, the at the time when you were coming in, was there many other up-and-coming artists at the same time? Yeah, loads, because this was only 2017. Right. So it wasn't even that long ago. Do you still see them, those guys on the circuits? Yeah, I gig with all of them. Fair enough. And that, <laughs> um, that's just made my, my question ridiculously shit, so I'm going to have to quickly change it. You know what? It's your podcast. You can cut it out. You're in no, charge. No, no, I don't, no, I don't, I don't like to cut it from that way. I just like to, you know, sometimes... Get myself into trouble when I when I when, when go I, down a little cul de sac. Yeah, yeah, no, which is fine. Which is kind of like that's just normal life. Exactly, exactly what you were just saying. Life yeah. and art. Um, exactly. So the next, the, the the I'll give you this. Um, the podcast itself is called the bandwagon, and I I offer this to every guest that I have. Um, if there's a certain bandwagon that they want to jump off, or they actually got an opinion on this is that I give them this their free space to kind of uh, um, jump on board really on, on what they want to get off their chest oh don't say that we'll be here for hours what have other fine. people said in the past what kind of thing have they kind of gone for uh, a lot of people it's surprisingly what I've experienced from from listening to to um, uh, to the guests has been the themes around being judged yeah. Um, the the impact of social media and tro- trolling, especially, um, I think one of the areas that w- was about the lack of people from South Asian communities getting in into the area of work. So, like uh, one was like a Sikh historian. There wasn't mm. that many of the younger generation where he thought yeah. there would have been a lot of people. I think Bobby's was very interesting. Bobby Friction when he was talking about how we don't the, the, in terms of like the unity within within um within the south asian community of pulling people together forward mm-hmm. and once people have broken into that mainstream they do, they very rarely or if not pull somebody off they've like oh i've done that now i've, I've made yeah. it i've got i've got rid of you know not rid of it i've jumped on that bandwagon jumped on that step and i've i've i've, I've, I've made it to the other side yeah um, yeah, I think that's been sort of like some of the general general stuff. I think if I was generally to say something, it would probably be around expectation. Because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot in terms of my show, in terms of my own life and stuff, about expectation. And all I would really say is whether you... Something happened a few... Like, actually, while I was doing this show, while I was doing Life Sucks, and I think this will explain what I mean. Oh... I was doing a one of the early shows of Life Sucks in central London and uh, it was a lovely like it's like cute little intimate venue so we had quite a small audience it was brilliant I went to say hello to my friends and then I went back into the venue to get my bag and stuff went back into the space got my bag thanked everybody like the tech people and stuff and I saw there were still a couple of uh, audience members in their room and my mic was still on the stage and stuff and one of them and they were women and I guess they were probably around my age maybe they were in the 40s maybe early early 40s I don't know 
and one of them was on the holding the mic like she was at the mic I was like oh my god what is she doing but like she was holding the mic and she was saying to her friend or whoever was with her she was saying can you take a photo of me can you take a photo of me and I was like just like oh well fine do you know what I mean you want a souvenir of the night that's actually quite nice and she came off stage to me and she said all I wanted to do was be an actor all I wanted to do and I'm actually getting a bit choked up when I listen low when I think about it now because she was so genuine and so sincere she's like all I wanted to do was perform and I was never allowed to do it and she went it's too late for me now and it broke my heart and I still like that was you know gosh almost two years ago and it really chokes me up when I think about the cage that expectation puts you in Mm. whether that's to do with career whether that's to do with you know your life partner whether that's to do with whatever life choices or you know whatever it is in your life or your education or where you want to live or the kind of life that you want to lead expectations are a cage and it might feel like it's a cage that doesn't have a key or it's a cage that you don't have access to the key or whatever I don't really know where I'm going with this metaphor but I just want to say that there is another side of it like you can step out of the cage that is a possibility how you choose to do that or whatever is up to you but know that you have the power to be able to step outside that expectation as soon as you become aware of it you've literally got the key in your hand I was a bit deep, isn't it? Sorry, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> You're was... like, oh, it's a Sunday morning. Let's get a suck on. I'll have a bit of a laugh. I've got the house to myself. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, no, it it does it the expectation of being a ca- it, um being a cage is is yeah. I think it comes there's a lot of stuff around opportunity, having the risk to take that opportunity, you know. Yeah, that of course. Being brave, being brave to, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, or like just being conditioned a certain way. Do you know what I mean? We're all, we're all, we're all a product of how we're brought up, essentially. All a product of our conditioning. But, yeah. but, but it's, when you start looking at your life and you go, and this is, life looks a little bit about this, it's about expectation, about not worrying what other people think. It's really easy though, isn't it? Because you know social media. Don't think about what other people say. They don't pay your bills. You know, it's like, yeah, Mandeep, that's hilarious. You've reposted that on your thing or whatever. But what are you doing about that? Are you happy? Are you still caged in your expectation? Do you know what, you know, be kind. What does that mean? It's about- Literally, oh, tell me, what does that mean? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's like, um, yeah, don't take other people's opinions seriously and stop moaning and that. But your that post is actually a moan. Moaning. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, something's- um, I d- I've done it before. It's like, oh, this is your karma and all this kind of stuff. And especially at football, isn't it? Like, because <laughs> it really pisses me off. Serious stuff, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I realised actually, hang on, that's my karma. You know, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, oh, the, the irony on uh, social media is just a hilarious. Sometimes it's yeah. hilarious. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's not. But but that but you know, and the, but I thought I wanted to. The reason I wanted to say all of that is because I think that most of your listeners, if not all of your listeners will relate to that mm-hmm. it's not about being an artist or being whatever do you know what i mean could be you know you might not you might hate the arts that's fine cool um there you go no thanks for that so i really appreciate it you know um you know write that down it's gonna be my uh, second book expect yeah. your cage yeah 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 what cage of I? expectations is it that's a film well expectation <laughs> is a Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'll send you back. You, you, you can. Just, I'll chop. I'll chop that bit up, really, and you can have. Let it. me go patent that before you put it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Um, Thanks, good, man. good luck with the with the with the tour. Um, you. you'll see us and a, and a bunch of others on the on the on your first date. So uh, oh, amazing. That'd be that'd be really good. And to get your um to get your tickets i'll put the link on onto here and um, especially when the book comes out and you're ready to you know you've got an open door here so anytime you want to kind of plug that or anything oh thank you that's so kind this would be such a lovely way to spend a sunday afternoon thank you i know pro- possibly the hottest day of the year so apologies yeah i mean that. thanks for that i'm literally you know i live two minutes from a beach i could I, be I on a beach I did see, I with did my see. mummy out right yeah. just <laughs> With an ice cream in my hand, and instead I'm here. So yeah. there you go. Shows how much well, love I have for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, that's it. Nice one. Nice one, man. Cheers. Cheers.